death is a terrible blow, no question about it. But although this mission was costly, it may well prove to have been worth the price. I wish I could believe that. You mustn't lose sight of our objectives. The sacrifice of any or all of us is a small price to pay to preserve the lives we will save if we are successful. Tom knew the risks. So did Bruno. So do you. Knowing the risks doesn't really prepare you for losing a partner. It certainly doesn't prepare you for losing two. Nothing can prepare you. The loss of an operative is never expected and is always tragic. But as horrible as it sounds, it's also inevitable. It's a dangerous job. Perhaps Mr. Smith is right. Perhaps I'm not up to the task. Rubbish. You've performed remarkably well under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. I confess I was somewhat skeptical at first, but that was before I grasped the magnitude of the situation. In my entire tenure as a field operative, I never once faced a crisis this formidable, and certainly can't say I would have done so with the aplomb and competence you've demonstrated thus far. I didn't realize you were a field operative. Indeed, for 14 years. After the war, I found I was having a hard time adjusting to civilian life. Fortunately, an old acquaintance of mine was recruiting for Unity and happened to ring me one afternoon. I've never looked back. Sort of difficult to imagine, isn't it? Not at all. You flatter me. Anyhow, let's have no more self-pity. What do you say? Yes, sir. So before you served on the committee, you and Bruno were colleagues. And friends. Did you ever work together on an assignment? Frequently. We lost track of how many times we'd saved each other's lives. And you still believe he was capable of treason? In my heart? No. Intellectually? I don't quite know what to believe. No question about it. He was always a steadfast, resourceful fellow. But the history books are full of patriots turned traitors. There's no telling what a man is capable of, given the appropriate temptations. I know what I believe. I admire your conviction, and I pray you're right. Ah, Mr. Smith, I hope you have some good news. Good news would be that we hadn't lost another valuable agent on this mission. What news do we have? Well, our analysis of Agent Archer's photographs is complete. And? We have a possible lead on Dr. Schenker's whereabouts. I think we can classify that as good news. As I said, it's all relative. This harm situation isn't the only crisis in the world, and we're fast running out of competent field agents. Then suppose you get to the point and tell us what we know about Dr. Schenker so we can go fetch him. It's somewhat speculative at this point, but it's possible that Harm is keeping him at a secret underground research facility in North America. We don't know the exact location of this facility, but thanks to the files Archer photographed, we know it exists, apparently in the vicinity of a lumberyard in western Washington state. It seems the site is being supplied by an American Railways passenger train. Records and research has dug up evidence of various trains making unscheduled stops in the area over the past three weeks. At regular intervals? Indeed. Probably to drop off supplies and personnel. We're certain that at least one American Railways engineer is on the harm payroll, although several individuals may be involved. We're looking into it. What's my assignment? Phase one will be to apprehend the engineer or engineers in question so that we can interrogate them. Once you're aboard the train... How exactly am I to get aboard? We'll smuggle you into the galley car. Lovely. Anyhow, once you're aboard, you will meet with a contact who will tell you precisely whom you'll need to detain. It is safe to presume that other harmed personnel will be aboard the train, so subtlety is advisable. Needless to say, seizing the conspirators will prevent the train from making its stop, so you'll have to be sure to detrain at the appropriate time. 
Well, after falling out of an airplane, I suppose jumping off a moving train can't be that bad. That won't be necessary. Once your objectives are complete, you must head for the caboose and detach it when you're near the lumber yard. We'll have an agent in place to switch the track and reroute you to an unused depot behind the lumber yard. This area is not likely to be heavily guarded, so you shouldn't have much difficulty getting through. If all goes according to plan, you will rendezvous with another undercover agent who will, we hope, have information that should help you locate the underground base. Then I grab Dr. Schenker and get the hell out. Precisely. We'll have a helicopter nearby awaiting your signal. Your flight departs in one hour, so if you need to stop by the toy shop, now's the time. Understood. Thank you for putting things in perspective for me, sir. I promise you I will do everything in my power to destroy harm. Archer? Sir? Don't let anger cloud your judgment. Revenge is an understandable impulse, but it is also a contemptible one. Our job is not to avenge, but to protect. I can't just shut off my feelings like a tap. No, but you can bridle them and use them to fuel your resolve. Destroy harm, but do it to save innocent lives, not to retaliate for those already lost. The moment you give in to wrath, you become as reprehensible as the monsters were hunting. Clearly, we are all called upon to take lies from time to time, but we must neither relish it nor agonize over it. It is a duty, plain and simple. Not a pleasant one, but often a necessary one. I'll do my best, sir. I have absolute confidence that you will. There was one more thing, although I'm not sure how important it is. According to one of the documents Archer photographed, it seems the Baron's wife changed her surname some time ago. Really? So her maiden name isn't McLean? It's Farnsworth. Felicity Farnsworth? Are you quite sure? Positive. Do you know of her? I that I do. When she was eight years old, her father, a wealthy banker, was involved in a nasty public scandal involving unmentionable acts with a twelve-year-old boy. How dreadful. Mr. Farnsworth committed suicide shortly thereafter. Felicity and her mother, by all accounts of vapid socialite, were ruthlessly ostracized by their peers. Guilt by association, presumably. Furthermore, rather than inheriting the fortune she expected, Mrs. Farnsworth discovered that her late husband had left the family in inescapable debt. She went quite mad. Several days after being institutionalized, she hung herself. My word, that poor child. Felicity fell into the custody of an elderly aunt whose lifestyle was apparently rather more severe than she was accustomed to. About a year later, the aunt took a fatal tumble down the stairs. Foul play? No mention was ever made. What happened to the girl? She ended up with a foster family where she remained until she was 14. One night she went out her bedroom window and was never seen again. Or at least no one recognized her. Astonishing. Where did you learn so much about her? I studied her. Come again? I believe I first read about her in a gossip column. I was intrigued by the similarities in our background, so I dug deeper. What similarities? Well, we both came from wealthy families. We were both orphaned at a relatively early age. Our fathers both killed themselves, although for very different reasons. We were both plunged into undesirable circumstances and resorted to rather desperate measures to survive. I found it quite uncanny at the time, although in retrospect I think we had less in common than I once believed. Adversity is the truest test of character. The strong are strengthened by it, the weak made weaker. It sounds like this Baroness didn't have the wherewithal to cope with her misfortunes. It's a common trend among terrorists and bullies that they imagine themselves persecuted by fate and therefore feel justified in harming others. You're frothing. Sorry, I get carried away. She's involved somehow. The Baroness? Upon what unimpeachable evidence are you basing that supposition? I just have a feeling. Ah, then the case is as good as closed. I don't expect you to believe me, but I'll count on you to say something smug if I'm right. It's virtually guaranteed. I'm not smug. Acerbic, perhaps, maybe even sardonic, but not smug. Okay, sure, whatever you need to tell yourself. I have to agree with her, Smith. Don't either of you have work to do. Aye, sir. Off I go. Good luck.